Welcome to Graphx. In this tutorial, we'll show you everything you need to get from raw data to your insights. We'll use two datasets, one containing tweets posted by Donald Trump, from where we'll find the main narratives and topics, and how those correlate with his popularity, and one containing information about the Titanic passengers, with which we'll try to explain survival rates. We will do so by following these four steps. Here, we'll bring the data from a spreadsheet or database into Graphx. Next, we'll identify the nature of each variable from our dataset and apply a recipe made of transformation functions and machine learning algorithms to our data. Then, we analyze the data, the fun part. We'll find insights by using the interactive interfaces we've designed to help you detect these patterns. Lastly, we'll see how you can save and share these findings with your team. When you log into Graphx, this is the first thing you'll see. On this left column, you can see your personal team, teams of people, and public. These are folders of projects that you can share with whoever has a Graphx account. In public, you'll find projects that we've created and you can explore. Today, we'll use our two databases, Donald Trump's tweets and the Titanic passenger information. To upload these datasets, we can simply click on the dataset folder and on New Dataset. We can upload many accepted formats, such as CSV, XLSX, JSON, SPSS, .sav. If we create a zip file out of various files, we can upload this dataset into Graphx and it will join it together. For example, let's say I have Donald Trump's tweets as well as Joe Biden's tweets. I can upload them together by creating a .zip file containing both datasets. We can also simply drag the file into Graphx and it'll upload. We allow you to connect with your own databases, API endpoints, and data lakes, so you can also upload data from things like Google Sheets, BigQuery, or Azure. In the future, Graphx will be able to automatically refresh data that gets renewed, but so far we don't have this feature. You'll also be able to connect directly to Salesforce, HubSpot, Shopify, or any of their CRM or service where your data is stored. When you upload a dataset, Graphx automatically infers the data types for you. It divides variables into quantitative, categorical, text, etc. It's right pretty much every time, but if a variable is ambiguous, you can check and change them manually by clicking here and selecting the option you want. If we can match the data types and variable names with projects we've done in the past, Graphx will automatically suggest a recipe. A recipe is a predefined workflow already containing instructions to clean, prepare the data, and apply algorithms to create a project and insights automatically for you. However, for most datasets, chances are high that you'll have to create your own recipe. In the case of the Donald Trump Tweets database, Graphx will recommend some options. Tweets are a popular source of data, so Graphx already has some recipes prepared. In this case, we'll go for content analysis, which is the most interesting recipe for exploring a large corpus of text. Behind the scenes, Graphx will do a number of things to pre-process and prepare the data for the analysis. It'll remove empty words, it'll do stemming, which is extracting the roots of words, it'll create embeddings of the tweets, connecting them by similarity, by simply clicking on continue, our project will be on its way. While it's getting ready, we can also prepare the recipe for our Titanic Passengers project. Let's click on New Project and then select our dataset. We can organize our variable before even creating a project. Here, I'll sort them by the ones I intuitively think will be more important, putting things like gender before number of siblings and spouses. When working with the Titanic data, our goal is more focused towards predicting survival rather than analyzing the passengers, and we'll have to change our recipe to reflect that. We want to predict the chances of surviving the Titanic by taking into account these 12 variables. Here, we'll use other as none of the above are applicable, and then understand your target using UMAP and HDB scan. This will create a predictive model where we can explore which combination of our variables increases or decreases chances of survival. First, we choose our target variable, which in this case is survived, since we want to explain this variable. And then, we pick here the variables that we want to analyze and see how they influence in chances of survival. In this case, we're talking about Titanic passengers, but they could be your customers, with variables regarding the products and services they buy from you. You could use the same recipe to try and predict whether or not they'll keep paying for your product or service. Graphx also lets you enrich your data. You can do things with things like demographics information via census data. If your data comes from your CRM and this data includes the addresses of your customer, you could also enrich your data with information like the probable income or how many supermarkets they have nearby. You can add this information from Census or Google Business API, and we'll continue expanding our options at Graphx. If we click Finish or Continue, a new project will be automatically created. Before we go there, I'd like to show you something. 
If we click on Advanced Editor, this will show up. Don't panic, I know it might look like coding in Python or R and graphics was made to avoid code, but it's actually our own code. We have over 100 functions that allow you to treat the data with all the flexibility you would have in Python or R. You don't need to open this at all unless you feel our wizard is too limiting for the creativity you have in mind. And the code itself is not as complex as any programming language, it's really just one function after the other. If you're interested in learning more, check out the technical docs linked here or explore our help center. Once your project is loaded, simply click on it to open it. As you can see, there's a graph in the middle and two bars on either side with histograms of each variable from your dataset. The graph in the center is made up of dots connected by lines. These dots are called nodes, and each node represents one row from our dataset. Nodes that are similar get connected. Depending on the type of data, graphics will apply different algorithms to calculate these similarity metrics. For instance, two Trump tweets will get connected if they talk about similar concepts, and we calculate these similarities by applying something called wart to vec Meanwhile, in our Titanic passenger survival project, two passengers of the Titanic will be connected if their characteristics, such as age, gender, or the fare they paid, are similar and they have a similar outcome if they died or survived. GraphX automatically finds regions of the graph where the connections are especially dense, and separates them visually by color. We call them clusters. Clusters of similar nodes are a proxy for patterns. For instance, all of these tweets from Trump form a cluster because they're made of words that talk about news stations such as Fox, CNN, or about polls. Let's explore now the clusters from our Titanic database. We can see first of all that when we enter the project there are way too many names. We can change this by going up here to change label density and make it way less so that there are not that many names over here. We can then click on any of the clusters to explore what differentiates them from the rest. So we can see that this cluster is made up of males that were third class and uh, pretty young from, from 25 to 35 years old. If we want to explore our target variable, which is the survived, we can click on it here because we pinned it on the left and we can see that they didn't really have good chances of survival. The lines connecting the nodes here serve to show that node's neighbors are the nodes most similar to it. By clicking on a node, we'll open up information about said node, as well as some options for that specific node. On the top left corner, we can also access settings, create insights, download our graph, modify label density, or search for specific terms, as well as make the graph full screen or make a selection of an area of nodes. Let's go to our Trump Tweets project. Apart from the graph, we can see that there are two bars on either side with histograms of variables from our dataset. The bar on the right is our list of variables. Each variable represents one of the columns from our dataset. If we want to select data that meets a certain criteria, we can simply make a selection in any of our charts, and graphics will show the corresponding nodes in the graph. We can do this with any type of variable, and we can also cross-filter by filtering in one variable and then filtering in another. If we want to find a specific term in a variable, we can use the search bar and then select it to add it to the viewable list. And it'll show up down here. We also have different options here. This one lets us dictate the size of the nodes via that variable. This one lets us change the color of the nodes. And this one lets us see more stats on that variable, such as the quartiles. In some cases, a bar like this one will show up. This is really just another type of filter, the NAND bar, or not a number bar indicates how many of our nodes have a designated value for this variable, so we can differentiate nodes with null values and nodes with existing values for that specific variable. For example, in this case, some tweets simply didn't have hashtags in them, so there are null values in the hashtags columns for those tweets. We can click on either side of the bar to select that specific set of nodes. We use this bar on the left to pin variables that the user wants to understand or predict. For instance, in this project, I know I'm going to want to use the adjectives that Donald Trump used. So I can simply click here and then pin the variable to place it on the left and make it more easily accessible. The left bar also shows the clusters calculated from the graph. And when we do any selection, we'll see a list of variables here that GraphX identifies most clearly differentiate that selection from the rest. When you create a project, it also includes a variable which will dictate the size of the nodes. In this case, this variable is retweets. But remember that we can change this by going to any other numerical variable and clicking on size mapping. Let's do a quick analysis of how Donald Trump has been tweeting these past few years. Graphics arranges tweets into clusters that already give some pretty interesting information. 
There's a cluster containing more than a thousand tweets just about himself. That's amazing. The biggest cluster talks about Democrats and Hillary Clinton, which is not very surprising. And there's also an entire cluster containing two and a half thousand tweets that have to do with fake news. Here, in adjectives, we can see his favorite word, great, which he's used in almost 4,000 tweets. Let's see in what context he used it most. We can select all tweets containing the word great by simply clicking on it, and then organize the clusters by uplift, which orders them according to the frequency in the selection versus the whole dataset. And voila, here we can see the famous Make America Great Again popping up, as well as some book recommendations. We can also see which proper nouns he used it most with, and unsurprisingly, he also likes to call himself great. Now let's take a look at his most popular tweets, and what they have in common. We can click on the number here, and enter any value we like to adjust the interval. Tweets upwards of 25,000 retweets were in the top 10% most retweeted. We can see that the topics he had outstanding success with were the ones related to immigration, justice, or his famous fake news. Actually, one of his most popular tweets is this one of him beating up CNN. This is the flow of GraphX, and the way you can use GraphX to find interesting information out of thousands and thousands of rows from your dataset. Let's say we want to save this information. GraphX does this through insights. To create an insight from our graph, simply click here and then on Create Insight. It will open up a tab allowing us to add a title or edit our insight. Here we'll type something like, fake news is a topic that does well for Trump. We can see all our insights later in the Insights tab. Let's go now to our Titanic project. This is a numerical and categorical dataset, as opposed to the text-based dataset from Trump's tweets. So we'll use it to see how to work with these types of variables. Note that now on our left column we have HDBS clusters, because the recipe we picked was HDBS and UMAP clustering. And HDBS is just another type of clustering algorithm. Our aim here is to find patterns that explain the chances of survival of each passenger. A good idea would be to select passengers that survived and see what they have in common. We can even create a new segmentation differentiating passengers that survived and passengers that didn't. Let's just click on New Segmentation and then Manual, which will prompt us to give it a name. We then segment the data by survival to create our new segmentation. Click on the plus icon here and name it to whatever we want. We can now segment our data and survived and died. We can also color them visually to separate the notes to our liking. Here, I think it kind of makes sense the color survived as green and died as red, so let's go ahead and do that. By clicking on the settings icon here, we can arrange our variables in whichever order we want, or add a description for each variable. Here, for example, I'll specify that SIPSP means the number of siblings or spouses aboard, and uh, parts over here is the number of parents or children aboard. Let's explore our clusters. We can adjust them or create our own. In our automatic segmentations or clusters, clicking Edit Segmentation will open up a menu. Here, we can change the color of a cluster to any color we like, rename a cluster, or edit the segmentation. If we click on Configure Clustering, we can dictate how dense we want our clusters to be. In this case, I think there are too many clusters for how little nodes there are, so I can simply make the clusters denser to reduce how many of them there are. Let's click on cluster 13, for example, the one alone over here. Let's say we want to color it green. To better understand the differences between this cluster and the rest of our data, we can look at the list of significant variables. This is an index that pops up when we click on a segmentation that indicates the variables that most differentiate it from the rest. By clicking on each variable, GraphX will highlight it for us, showing, for example, that this cluster is made up solely of people that boarded in Queenstown. We can click here on Explain Cluster Variable to learn more about the differences between this cluster and the rest of the dataset in the Compare tab. The cluster we are talking about, Cluster 13, is most differentiated by the fact that they all boarded in Queenstown, they were all female, and they all boarded in third class, and more than three quarters of them survived. Let's go now to our Donald Trump project. We can also form new clusters by clicking on New Segmentation. If we click on Automatic Segmentation, we can create different segmentations of our data through clusters made automatically by GraphX. And we can use this new segmentation along with our original clustering and change seamlessly between them simply by clicking on color mapping. We can create automatic segmentations of any series of notes we select. Let's say we want to make subclusters out of one cluster. Now I'm going to pick this one, the Democrats and Hillary Clinton cluster. We pick it, then go to new segmentation and automatic segmentation, and GraphX will automatically make subclusters based on the content of the tweets. 
If we open the compare tab, something like this will appear. Here we have the list of clusters we saw before, as well as the list of subclusters we made. Let's say we want to pair one cluster against the other. We'll choose this cluster on the left side, and then we click on the plus icon to select what segmentation you want to compare it to. The list of variables from your dataset will appear comparing them. The order in which they appear is automatically set to best explain the differences between what we have chosen to compare, but this can be changed to explain the things most similar between them. We can also change representation to different options, or save our findings as insights. If we click on the Trends tab, we are given different options to create charts. Overview is a simple bar chart, with a variable on the vertical axis chosen here, and a variable on the horizontal axis chosen here. The variable on the horizontal axis is always a temporal one, so that we can see the trends of the data through time. Each node was one of our rows of data, and node count simply means the number of nodes spread over time. If we pick any other variable, we can see not only node count, but also different factors like sum, minimum, or variance. We can also choose the density of bins by choosing how often to show the data. To change types of graphs, we can simply click here. Segmented overview is the same concept as our overview chart but in this case, it is broken up by the clusters of our choice. To change the type of segmentation, we simply click on color mapping for the segmentation we want, and the graphs will change automatically. Compared segments lets us again see all our different clusters, but this time in line charts instead of bar charts. The last option, shared, divides the area in the graph to let us see the proportions of each cluster. Note that here, the vertical axis is counted in relative terms and not in absolute values. In all of these graphs, we can add annotations by clicking here. For example, here I want to say that Donald Trump talked especially about fake news. We can upload these graphs into our Insights tab simply by clicking here, which will open our Add Insight window, and we can download the image or SVG file of the graph by clicking here. Now on to our last step, reporting your insights. When we find interesting information, whether it be in our graph, in our Compare tab, or in our Trends, we might want to save this information. GraphX allows you to do this on the app itself by saving graphs as insights that will appear in the tab above. To save an insight, simply look for this icon. It will appear in our graph over here. In our charts, we can look for it by clicking here and then clicking Save as Insight. In the Compare tab, we can see it over here and also by clicking on any of the graphs. And in the Trends tab, we can see it up here to the right. When you create an insight, you have the option to edit it, but you can also go to the Insights tab at any point and edit your insights there. Here, we'll give it a description explaining how we got this information. You can also create new insights from the tab itself, or edit insights you already have by adding charts or graphs. We also have a really cool option here at GraphX. You see over here in the insights, we have this play icon over here. Let's go back to our graph and clear the selection, as if you just entered the project and you're starting from zero. If we go to our insights and click on that play button, the project will be automatically updated to show exactly what was shown when we created this insight so you can save your process through Insights as well. On the top left, you have viewing options for Insights, including a foam strip view, the standard list view, or presentation mode, and clicking on Export will automatically download a high-quality PDF with all of your sites. We hope this video was helpful, and if you have any doubts, don't hesitate in contacting us. Thank you for your time, and we hope you enjoy GraphX.